So we're going to dive right into our session on media measurement and optimizing uh, in a privacy-centric environment. And for this, I'd like to introduce Lucas Lawn. Lucas is a product manager at Tag Inspector and is passionate about all things data privacy and also a fellow Cincinnati Reds fan. So Lucas, I'm excited to hear this. Take it away. All right. I'll get you the third all right on there, Dom. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining here today. As Dom mentioned, uh, my name is Lucas. I work with a large number of global organizations on uh, data strategy, specifically as it relates to privacy. So, so what I want to cover here today is specifically the topics of media measurement and optimization in this new uh, privacy-centric environment that we're really uh, moving into, and a lot of you are already in today. Now, how we'll go through this, we'll explore four of the primary challenges that organizations are kind of facing today as have been expressed through a number of different um, questions and engagements. And then we'll start to talk through some of the various different solutions and recommendations in order to, um, to address each of those challenges. So let's jump into the first challenge. Um, and this is the one that we hear a ton about, um, the impending deprecation of third-party cookies, specifically Chrome dropping um, support for third-party cookies um, in the next couple of years, um, the, the timeline. That was a little bit hazy, but basically this translates to organizations struggling with the concept of having difficulty with measuring the full customer journey and being able to accomplish any kind of cross-channel measurement uh, for the various different media um, and, and advertising campaigns that are being run. Now, traditionally, any kind of data integration across multiple sources, in this case um, for the web, across multiple domains, it would require some sort of a key value to marry together those data sets. So to do things like associate conversions on your owned and operated websites, um, back to clicks and impressions on publisher websites. Um, that's really the impact of uh, this cookie apocalypse, as a lot of people like to, to term it. Now, the reality is, for a lot of you that are joining us here today in um, the retail space, this future state is already a current state. If you look at general statistics of usage of uh, browsers like Safari, as well as browsers like Firefox, that have already deprecated support for those third par party cookies, um, it constitutes about 25% of overall um, internet usage. With many retailers, that proportion is far, far higher. We work with some partners where that proportion of users leveraging technologies that have already deprecated third party cookie support is up to 60% of their overall site traffic. So, when we talk about these different strategies and when you're you know, kind of reading about and thinking about what are we gonna do when third party cookies are gone, you're probably already doing it, <laughs> what you are going to do uh, when third party cookies are gone. And now it's just about refining um, and modifying some of those strategies to be able to gain a further competitive advantage. So let's talk about some of these solutions. Um, and a lot was talked about in the past discussion with Michael and Neil, um, around consumer relationships, understanding our consumers um, and getting to be able to do things like an LTV analysis and have named user cohorts. Now, what I mean by this in terms of focusing on increasing that proportion of named users is increasing the proportion of users that you have a direct relationship with, users that are registering with you and are voluntarily providing identification and preference information. Now, Today, um, and some analyses that we have done leveraging GA data across a large number of D2C e-commerce companies, on average, about 5% of site visitors are registered um, or logged in to the website. Now, what's interesting about that 5% is that in a lot of our studies, that 5% actually accounts for roughly 40% of total transactions. Now, we could get into LTV analyses and things like that. It doesn't take advanced analysis to understand that this cohort, this customer segment um, that I have that closer relationship with is high value. These are the types of individuals, the types of users that I'm wanting to, um, to target, to understand where they're coming from, what content they're interested in, how they're interacting with my website so that I can optimize for users similar to them. 
So number one, increase that proportion of those named users, and then start to um, really leverage that named user cohort in order to be able to mine insights. Um, Neil was talking about it previously, customer segmentation, understanding who those individuals are, what their preferences are, so that we can then extrapolate those insights out uh, to be able to start activating um, within our entire full data set and optimize our media practices. Now, a core concept related with this is, um, again, what was discussed earlier in having that effective value exchange in order to be able to increase that proportion. And what this really comes down to is having a demonstrable benefit for the user. In retail, I think it's a little bit simpler to conceptualize because I think of my offline customer experience where I go into a store. At times, I just want to browse. I don't want anyone to help me. I don't want to answer any questions. I don't want to give any information. It's like a user that you know doesn't want to register with you, doesn't want to consent. You know, all you can do is hope that your store is set up in such a way that's you know most popular or the um, kind of most likely to purchase products are available, and you know everything is uh, is smooth in terms of the experience for that user. Other times, I need help. I want to speak with an associate in the store, discuss what it is that I'm looking for. They can help me with sizing. They can help me with what things look like. That's the type of experience in, that you can have with that registered user where you can understand the preferences, what they're looking for, past history, um, as well as use your expertise from general observation um, and just understanding your users um, in general in order to be able to provide that better experience. But having that demonstrable benefit within the value exchange uh, with the user is critical in order to be able to increase that proportion of named users, which you can then really leverage for measurement as well as activation use cases. Now, another concept here that I just want to introduce is uh, managing your own first party identifiers. Now, when I talked about activation um, or even leveraging those first party identifiers in order to accomplish measurement use cases. We're talking about things like uh, clean rooms. Um, there's a number of other type of identity resolution solutions out there on the market. And all of this you're really drives for that need for that first party data integration. You, from more of a technical sense, managing your own first party identifiers, which you can then associate all of those related IDs to, is going to be a huge boost when it comes to both compliance as well as when it comes to activation and integration down the line. So think about this as you're thinking about increasing that named user cohort, not just how you are improving that relationship with users, but also how you're managing that data and how you're managing those identifiers um, in order to, to be able to accomplish all those use cases in the future. Now that's challenge number one around just specifically the deprecation of third-party cookies. Now, Next slide here, we'll get into the next challenge. So challenge number two is a little bit broader beyond just third-party cookies. Also, the lack of identifier access generally hindering various different measurement and optimization use cases. Now, this translates specifically to the problem of how can I optimize without the ability to measure current campaign effectiveness? Now, we talked about it before, traditionally third-party cookies and other cross-channel identifiers have made this practice uh, easy, <laughs> at least in principle, not always in practice. Uh, but in the absence of these solutions, how do we approach attribution and thus be able to optimize future activities use, or from past results? Now, some of the various different solutions here are, are just different measurement techniques that I like to refer to as non-cookie-based measurement techniques because they don't rely on um, identifiers in that traditional sense. Now, a few of these that you have um, likely heard um, in the past, number one is being regression-based attribution. Now, regression-based attribution, regression-based attribution is an extension of traditional media mix modeling. It uses aggregate ad and conversion data across channels and platforms in order to be able to provide calculations for attributed sales, effectiveness, efficiency, and ROI. So it can give you visibility uh, without the use of identifiers 
for both bottom of funnel, middle of funnel, and top of funnel activities that are included. Now, this is wonderful. A very good way of looking at past results and then being able to extrapolate and predict into the future. Now, there's a number of constraints here though. Number one, analysis of past performance in order to predict future helps with optimization. The kind of situation that we're moving into though, there's so much uncertainty. So it's not about necessarily how can we change what we've done in the past in order to be able to optimize and make those incremental improvements. Super important. As Michael mentioned before, the path to transformation is in those incremental improvements. And a lot of cases here with respect to privacy and some of the strategies and uh, different technologies in use, we're kind of jumping into the unknown. And so their regression-based attribution um, can uh, have a, a few shortcomings. Another kind of point to consider with this method is that it does require some clean historical data. Ideally, in order to be able to build out to these models, you would have between 18 and 24 months um, of, of data to be able to, to include. Many organizations can't do that. They don't have clean data for that time period uh, in order to be able to fit into these models. Now, number one, this underscores competitive advantage. If you have the foundation in place and if you have had a measurement foundation in place um, in order to be able to uh, generate and provide that information that you need for those inputs. But it's also a learning. If it's not in place today, it needs to be tomorrow so that you can begin to leverage some of these more advanced analysis, analyses or methods of analysis moving forward. Another non-cookie based uh, measurement technique that you can begin thinking about is geo-based uh, or geo-testing, and then measuring incrementality. Those can be super helpful in some of those areas where the regression-based attribution isn't quite as helpful. And that is in testing and measuring the effectiveness of new media and targeting strategies. So with this method, it's recommended to activate within a defined geographic area as to make a relatively significant budget modification for that area. Um, but still mitigating some of those risks to the overall uh, media budget and the media strategy. But here what you can do is test new strategies within that defined geo, and then measure the resulting incremental change in conversions, revenue, margin, et cetera, in order to be able to understand and test the effectiveness. We talk so much in, that, in, a, in the keynote about testing, just starting and trying new things. This provides a very good method of being able to test some of those different new methods, new strategies, and be able to measure the incremental impact um, on your macro conversions. Now, beyond some of those just general measurement techniques, another thing to keep in mind and to start really thinking about um, for more privacy-focused measurement are solutions such as consent mode where we can collect purely anonymous event-based data with no user information in order to still be able to understand things like how many conversions are happening, how, what products are being viewed on our websites, um, what content is being viewed, what is campaign effectiveness, but doing all of that without associating those interactions with individual users. So, Due to a lot of you know, cookie consent requirements and how tracking tags traditionally work, a lot of the partner sites that we work with in the EU um, have seen, in many cases, a reduction in observable traffic of over 50% once they implemented compliance consent management um, and compliant tracking. So this means that in those situations, they have no conversion data, no user interaction data, no campaign reporting, none of that for those users um, that have either opted out or not yet consented. So there's a big gap in observed behavior and there's no way of understanding how large that gap is nor where that gap is. So these types of uh, consent mode and anonymous tracking solutions allow for that anonymous collection of interaction data so for consenting users, you know, cookies are still set, full reporting is still available. Um, but for these anonymous instances, 
all conversions are visible, all interactions are visible, campaigns bringing users to the site are able to be analyzed. There are technical solutions to still be able to associate site acquisition in the campaigns and creative that's bringing users to the site with conversions so that we can still maintain that measurement foundation, extrapolate our insights from our named user cohorts, as we talked about before, extrapolate those out to our overall data um, anonymous user base as well, and then still have tracking, at least at the interaction level, uh, for our entire um, digital property audience.